Amen. One day, when we all get to heaven, all of us, including myself, will be able to sing harmoniously. Thank you, Concordia. And God really does deserve our highest praise, our total praise. Welcome to Avon Park Church, everybody. And everybody who's viewing online, we'd like to welcome you. Thank you for being so faithful. And it's been a great week. It's been a blessed week. It's been an interesting week. And it's great to be here to celebrate the goodness of God because he sustained us. He's kept us and he's gone before us and worked so many miracles on our behalf, many of which we do not know and will not know until we get to heaven. We serve a great God. We serve a great God. Okay. There's been so much spiritual warfare this week, over the last 24 hours. Um, my wife lost her phone. I didn't get to bed till 11 o'clock trying to find this phone, and it was in the neighbor's yard. A, a friend of ours got locked out. We went to help them, and oh, it was. And then AV couldn't find my PowerPoint. And I was like, oh no, all those hours of work are gone. You know how it feels, you know, it's God. But it was still there, praise the Lord. And now, the devil's up to it again, and I don't have control of the PowerPoint. Okay, they're going to reboot it. In the meantime, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pray. <laughs> we're going to pray. By your heads, close your eyes. Father of God, um, personally, on, on a personal level, gone through such a lot of spiritual warfare these past 24 hours. So we pray there, Lord, that you'll intervene on our behalf. We want to share a word together about you. We want to put you in the center of our lives. And we pray there, Lord, that you allow your angels that excel in power to come and tabernacle with us to stand God around this place, to push back the forces of darkness, to be a buffer between our fragile lives and souls and the enemy that would want to overwhelm us. We pray for the intervention of your Holy Spirit. We pray that he will come in and that we can experience him speaking to us, directing, guiding, nurturing us. We pray there, Lord, that every thought that is thought, every word that is said, and even every deed will bring glory and honor to your name, both now and forevermore, because you are God and God alone. We pray this in Jesus' name, whose blood has made everything possible. Let everybody say, Amen. 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 See, you pray and it works. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to remind you that we are in prayer meeting, and I invite you to come out. We're going to be having some great new leaders in prayer meeting, and we'll be leading out in, in our one hour of prayer, praise, and testimony. I remind you that there is a summer camp, and it's for all our young people who are 13 years and older. We invite you to come along and have a, a great time with us learning about the end times and preparing our young people to cope with the assault of Satan in the last days. And I remind you that there is a free event that we're doing. We have a professional farmer coming down by the name of Spencer Scott. He'll be teaching a gardening class. Anybody interested in gardening? Well, we have this professional gardener come down. Um, I invite you to sign up for this event, the Remnant Brunch, and, it, and it's all online. So I want to inform you that I'll be going on sabbatical. Not that you didn't know, and not that I'm happy. Am I happy? <laughs> I'm trying to look forlorn. <laughs> I'll be on sabbatical as of midnight tonight. You won't be able to get hold of me. <laughs> and um, I'll be gone for th uh, three months, just, just three months. 
Just it, it should be longer, shouldn't it? <laughs> three months, three months. So I won't be back until August. In the meantime, Jeff McDonald is in charge. Okay? Just call him up, night or day, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just call him up. <laughs> no, and, um, and also Pastor Rodney, Rod, Pastor Rodney's here. Pastor, our youth pastor, who's starting June the 1st. He's here at the back. So you stand up, Rodney, let everybody see you. Okay, that's Pastor Rodney McFadden. He'll be starting June the 1st. He doesn't start today. He starts June the 1st. June the 1st. That's not today. <laughs> okay. So he's not working for us today, but come June the 1st, he's working. Um, so, yeah, I'll be on sabbatical. Some, some people have been asking, what am I going to do on my sabbatical? Am I going to go to the Holy Land or some pilgrimage? I don't have that type of money. <laughs> so, no, I'll be doing gardening. I'll be getting my garden ready, fixing that up, and, and spending a lot of time at home. I'll be going doing some camp meetings in Georgia, Oklahoma, and Connecticut. So that's what I'll be doing with my time off and I'll be relaxing and enjoying myself and coming back refreshed and fired up for August. Amen? Amen. So that's what I'll be doing during my sabbatical. So, interesting things. So this, there's this guy called Dr. Brian Ardis, okay? And he, he's a doctor and he does all this research about the vaccine, the COVID vaccine and, and effects and so forth and he's, he's Follow, as he says, he likes to follow the money, follow the money, follow the money. And he's doing all this research and investigation about organizations and the powers that be and who's behind doing what and so forth, okay? And it's interesting what he says about the origins of it. You can look him up, Dr. Brian Ardis, okay? And I want to show you this video clip of what he said. Now, as far as, as I know, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. This guy is not a Seventh-day Adventist, as far as I know. But this is what he said. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's tech. Uh, but I am concerned that no one is acknowledging who the real threat is. I actually think, uh, and it's, it's not to, like I'm just making this up. I'm just going to tell you. As much, rad, much, much research as I do, as much looking into individuals and what they're saying, watch what they're saying, and then see who else is also saying the same thing. I actually think the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, Pope Francis, is over this entire thing. And I think he's manipulating, controlling the entire narrative. I think he's got Anthony Fauci in his pocket. I think he's got Joe Biden, Donald Trump, uh, Francis Collins. I think all of them are being controlled by a division of the Roman Catholic Church called the Order of the Jesuits, whose sole mission for the last 200 years I'm aware of, since 1857, they have been plotting to destroy the Constitution of the United States as the one last stronghold of a country that preserves and protects religious freedoms. And I think they want to, I think they've been plotting this whole time in many ways, either through wars, now through famine, now through uh, pandemics of a virus. I think it has been a, a complete attempt of them to destroy the constitution of the United States from within, to destroy the borders, to reduce, which is what they've said. We also have to reduce militaries of all countries, oh, demolish all borders of countries so we can create a one world religion with the Pope as the one world leader. Uh, and if you are not listening to what Joe Biden said, what Anthony Fauci is saying, what Walensky at the CDC is saying. Okay. So when I heard that, I thought, my goodness, he's not, as far as I know, he's not a Saint Adventist. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist, as far as I know. If you can research and find out, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I, I think, but this is what we're saying as a church. We, we, you know, we are saying that there is this conspiracy that is true, that's behind the scenes, and that the, the papacy is behind it all, and, and the, the papacy wants to uh, obtain power and, re, and, and the deadly wound to be fully healed. Isn't that our message? It's our message. Whether you agree with the vaccine or not, that's not the issue. What is the issue is that there's people out there who are saying what the Seventh-day Adventist church should be saying. I remind, it's remind me of when Jesus was entering Jerusalem and Jesus says, if these children stop praising, the rocks will cry out. And if we 
fail to give the message, God will use somebody else to give the message. I remember when we had this wonderful message, and we still have this wonderful message, the health reform. Do you remember this? And we should have been promoting it all over the place, but we kind of backpedaled and you know, kind of softened it down. And, but now the New Age movement is all over it. Okay, and they are promoting what we should have been promoting. We shouldn't let this happen with the three angels' message. We shouldn't let it happen with the three angels' message. I just thought that was interesting. You may not. I thought it was interesting. Secondly, there's this guy, Yovel Noah Harari. Anybody heard of this guy? Yeah, he's an obscure Israeli professor of history. Okay? He's a um, professor of history in Israel. And he's led to worldwide fame. He's led to worldwide fame after writing a book called Sapiens, which talks about life after humanity what the human being will evolve into and it's this transhumanism or the fourth industrial revolution have you heard of those things no transhumanism fourth industrial revolution is this idea this belief that where humanity is going towards is this hybrid between man and machine that there will be this synthesis of human, humanity and, and artificial intelligence and machines working together to create these incredible superhuman beings. And this is all part of the fourth industrial revolution. He's very clued in with a guy called Klaus Schwab. You heard of Klaus Schwab? Not your Charles Schwab of your investment schemes. No, I'm talking about Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. World Economic Forum. And because this is at the heart of the world. You know, have you heard of Davos? The Davos meetings in Switzerland and all that? Yeah, yeah. Where are you guys been? <laughs> so, the, the World Economic Forum is the power behind governments. The World Economic Forums are, are those people who, who elect People, people like um, President of um, Canada, President of Canada, Trudeau, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, one of his students is Trudeau. Okay, and other world leaders have gone through the World Economic Forum, their schooling, their education. These are the powers behind government, and their thinking is that we are going to get to a place where we own nothing and are happier than ever before. Have you heard that? Have you seen that? Well, this is the, this, the Har Yuval Noah Harari is part of the thinking behind this whole idea. Let me play you this clip about, from this um, professor. COVID is critical because this is what convinces people to accept, to legitimize total biometric surveillance. If we want to stop this epidemic, we need not just to monitor people, we need to monitor what's happening under their skin. What we have seen so far, it's corporations and governments collecting data about where we go, who we meet, what movies we watch. The next phase is the surveillance going under our skin. We now see mass surveillance systems established even in democratic countries, which previously rejected them. And we also see a change in the nature of surveillance. Previously, surveillance was mainly above the skin. Now it's going under the skin. Governments want to know not just where we go or who we meet. Above all, they want to know what is happening under our skin. What's our body temperature? What's our blood pressure? What, what is our medical condition? Now humans are developing even bigger powers than ever before. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. We are really upgrading humans into gods. We are acquiring, for instance, the, the power to re-engineer life. 
I know that in recent years we saw populist politicians undermining deliberately the trust that people have in important institutions like universities, like respectable media outlets. These populist politicians told people that, say, scientists are this small elite disconnected from the real people. I mean, all this story about Jesus rising from the dead and being the son of God, this is fake news. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. He says a lot. And it makes me think about Satan's conversation with Eve. You shall be as gods and here is this professor saying humans are acquiring divine powers god-like powers we can create you know when god created everything he looked at it and he said it was very good that means it was perfect and when god creates something perfect that means it cannot be improved it is very good. And here's the audacity of a human being saying we have powers that can trump God and improve on what God has created. This is the world we're marching towards. This is the world our children are going to be brought up in they are already prepping us for this they talked about surveillance we are getting used to, to surveillance some of you have chosen a car insurance policy that tracks you and monitors your dri driving how fast you accelerate and how, how hard you brake. it monitors your driving on the hope that you will get lower premiums some of you have chosen health insurance policies that monitors you and you have to do x y and z on these little apps to keep up your um qualification for these um benefits that the health or your life insurance or health insurance company provides you're accepting this surveillance and they already are prepping us for the greater surveillance where they can hack into us remember he said humans are hackable and they can monitor our bodies and hopefully in their minds even our thoughts this is a world we're going towards that's why we need to pray church we need to pray 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 that all that they plan doesn't come about and that God comes quickly Amen. by heads let us pray father God we pause once again inviting you to come into this world intervene Lord you see the evil that is planned for years and years and years Satan has been plotting and moving and 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 orchestrating things we pray the Lord that you will intervene frustrate his plans and save your people from his schemes save us rather right now their Lord speak to us open up our hearts and minds so that we can hear the truth and accept the truth we pray this in Jesus' name amen okay so we're on this journey through the last day events and so far we've looked at several things we looked at history repeating itself we we found out that's to, abs to be absolutely true we see that God gives signs as as um, as warnings to when he's going to move and that we're now living in a time of judgment that this church the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a remnant church but we're in a state of latest sin right now and that, that God is going to have a shaking in which he's going to eradicate the tears and keep the wheat within the church and that there'll be revival and reformation and re reformation is going to precede revival 
And then we learnt about forgiveness, we learnt about the latter rain, the outpouring, the refreshing, and we talked about the loud cry. Now if you've missed any of these sermons, I encourage you to go onto YouTube. The church has a YouTube channel, and the sermons are there on the YouTube channel. Okay, so you can go to the church's YouTube channel to watch it. You watch get the whole service. If you want just the sermon itself, go to my YouTube channel, and just the sermon is on the YouTube channel. So today, we're talking about the Sunday law. Heavy, heavy topic. The Sunday law. Oh my goodness! And there's so much information that I think we have to have a part one and part two of the Sunday law. So you get what part one today, and then when I come back <laughs> in August, you get part two. So you get all that time to digest it and work on it, okay? Part one of the Sunday law. Our scripture reading is this one. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Who is the he? Sorry? Say it like you believe it. It's Satan. Satan is the he. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Jesus. And this is the third temptation of Jesus. Now Satan is just laying down his cards saying, this is basically what I want. This is what I want. This is what Satan has always wanted from the very beginning. When he used to live in heaven, this is what he wanted. He wanted to be worshipped as God. And he's going to accept worship by any means, fair or foul. Because all he craves is for created being, even God himself, to worship him. That's our scripture reading, our memory verse. Tuck that away. Now, this is a chart that we're working through. If you haven't got one of these charts, I invite you to go to the Welcome Center, which is out the double doors. Turn right, you'll see the Welcome Center. And on the count of the Welcome Center, you see a few more of these charts. Just pick one up. So last time we did the latter rain. Now, before we go any further, we've got to go back and look at this topic, the Sunday law, because the Sunday law is going to be key to understanding so much of our future sermons. So the Sunday law. This quote from Mrs. White, let's read it together, everybody. And the final movements will be rapid ones. And the point I keep on making with this one is this. When we see these last events, when we see these last events, all these events are happening so quickly that they are overlapping. You, they're not just one, a pause, and then another, a pause, and then another. They're overlapping. So it says some people are thinking, I'll wait until the Sunday law to get ready. By that time, it's too late. It's too late. All these last events happen so quickly that you do not have time to get ready. You need to be ready now and remain ready so that when it does occur, you are not caught unawares. The last events will be rapid ones. So, the Sunday law, so much to talk about, so much to talk about. So, today we're going to look at its definition, what it is, the origins of it, and the USA. We're going to look at its purpose and where it's going. We're going to look at its history and shaking and the shaking, okay? And we're also going to be looking at how to get ready for it. And then, when I come back in August, we'll be looking at the church's response, that's be smart, God's seal, and the preparation, okay? So, that's what, that's what we need to cover in the Sunday law. Oh, my days. Okay, so we have a technical difficulty. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, we are going to sing a hymn, two verses of a hymn, 633. And 
while we're singing this hymn, I'm going to run to my office, get the right PowerPoint, run upstairs, give it to them, and come back before you've sung two verses. Do you think it's possible? We're going to, sit, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Six, three, three. Is it, we're marching to Zion? Not too fast now, because I've got to do a lot of running. Uh, too fast, okay. Okay. So this is what we call, you know, this is a spiritual warfare, everybody. I have mercy. There we go. You ready? Six three three. What is six three? When we all get to heaven, that's even better. Okay. Okay. So this is where we were. Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. So our definition for the Sunday law is this. The National Sunday Law is a federal law enforcing Sunday as a day of rest and then a day of worship. Okay, and this emphasizes two parts to the Sunday Law. First, the Sunday Law will be brought in that encourages us to rest. I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, I'll rest on Sunday. That's not a problem. The problem comes when they then say, no, you've got to worship on Sunday. And as Seventh-day Adventists, this is, what we're going, this is when we're going to have a problem. Okay? So it's a national law. We already have um, some blue laws, but we'll get into that. So is this idea biblical? Is the idea biblical? First of all, the phrase Sunday law appears how many times in the Bible? None. It doesn't appear at all in the Bible. So you think, how can we be talking about the Sunday law then? Well, you see, this phrase appears in the Bible. This phrase is the image of the beast is a biblical reference to the Sunday law. Now, if you don't know about the image of the beast, then that's a whole sermon on Bible study, okay? And if you do not know and you want to know about the image of the beast, I invite you to email me at info.avonpartchurch.com, okay? And we can arrange to have a Bible study about this leopard-like beast and the image that's set up for the beast. Okay, so we're going to break it down. So first thing, who is the beast? The papacy is the beast. This in itself is a whole sermon and Bible study. If you do not know why we say and why Protestants say that the papacy is the beast, then email info at avonpartchurch.com. And we'll have a Bible study about why Protestants, and not just Seventh-day Adventists, Protestants believe that the papacy is the beast. Now, please note, we are saying the papacy. That's the organization. We're not saying Catholics. Okay. We are not saying Catholics. We are saying papacy. It's just like, it's just like Russia is at war with Ukraine. And we're kind of upset with Mr. Putin. Okay? We're upset with Mr. Putin. So we, so, but we're not saying all Russians are bad. Are all Russians bad? No. No, but we do acknowledge that Putin and his organization is a problem. Okay? It's the same way with the papacy. Catholics, we have some very good Catholic people. And lots of Catholics will be saved. But the papacy is still the beast. The papacy is still the beast. Is that clear? And remember, if you don't know, info, dot, info at avonpartchurch.com. Okay, then we're saying that the image is Sunday worship. Okay, and once again, if you don't know, this is a whole sermon on Bible study about the change of Sabbath, the change of the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday and how that came about and how uh, is a mark of the authority of the papacy. That's a whole, a whole sermon and Bible study in and of itself. Okay, and if you don't know, who are you going to email? Info at avonpartchurch.com. 
okay? Well, sit down, and Jim Ayers is going to give you a wonderful Bible study about it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So with that being said, let's look at the Bible text that bring these things together. Revelation chapter 13 is a chapter in Revelation that you need to be going to. And it says this in verse 14 and 15. And deceivest them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now for some people that went whoosh, straight over their heads. Okay? Verse 15 says this, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed okay this is bible prophetic language i understand for some people it's really really complicated and they think oh what is this what is this what is this okay and we would like to break it down for you verse by verse, phrase by phrase, line upon line, so that you fully understand. But we cannot do it here and now. But please don't go away ignorant. Just email info at avonpartchurch.com and we will get you a Bible study that explains all of this. But this image of the beast is being set up by some other organization which we're going to find out about in verse 11 okay it's set up and it's, it's in honor and homage to the beast and the beast is the papacy so this image of the beast which is sunday worship is going to be set up in honor of the papacy and it's going to be enforced to the point where they will kill you if you do not worship on Sundays okay and it occurs elsewhere let's read some more text Revelation 14 verse 9 and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hands the Revelation 14 is all about the three Free angels message and this is the third angel going out and saying listen everybody if you worship the beast the papacy or his image Sunday you will receive a mark character okay Revelation 15 2 and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and then that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over his, the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the hearts of gold anybody want to stand on that sea every hand should be up they're talking about the saints the saved the redeemed the remnant every hand should be up we want to be standing on that sea of glass because we have gotten the victory over the beast his image and the mark of the beast Okay, um, Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vow upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So, you're thinking, Revelation 16, what's that about? Revelation 16 is talking about the seven last plagues and the first one goes out pouring his vial upon the earth and everybody who is accepting of the beast who is worshiping the image of the beast which is sunday worship is going to receive of the first plagues seven plagues they receive the first of seven revelation 19 verse 20 and the beast was taken and with him the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, which, which he deceived them that had 
received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's a, a wonderful description of hell. And how everybody who is opposed to the law of God will be destroyed in the fires of hell. Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Once again, we have the results, the, the story of what's going to happen to the redeemed, those who do not worship, who do not honor the beast, who do not receive his mark in their forehead or in his hands. Okay, so that's what the Sunday law is. A law enforced federally, mandating that we first rest and then worship on Sunday. So what's the origins of the Sunday law in particular as it relates to the United States of America? Okay, America is the beast with lamb-like horns. Okay, for some of you, you're thinking, what? What's this beast with lamb-like horns? Wow, I'm so glad you asked. Revelation chapter 13, going back to Revelation 13. Remember we read verses 14 and 15 before. Now we're going to look at verse 11. 11 says this, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, spake as a devil spake as a dragon. This lamb-like beast, this beast with lamb-like horns, is, according to Bible prophecy, the United States of America. Now, if you don't know this, if you don't know this, this is a whole sermon and Bible study in and of itself. Is that not true? It is. It's a, it's a, yeah, but we can explain it line upon line, precept upon precept. We can show you how the United States is the lamb light beast. Okay? If you don't know, just email info at avonparkchurch.com and we will give you a Bible study that explains clearly how the United States is the lamb light beast. Now, it's a lamb-like beast that actually sets up this image to the beast. And this is a lamb-like beast that causes the whole world to worship uh, the beast by honoring the image of the beast. Revelation 14 and 15, remember, we know it's the lamb-like beast. And these are the two verses we read before. And deceiveth them, so we know it's, it's America now, and America deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life and to the image. That means he's, the United States has the ability to take this Sunday law and enforce it in such a way that the law becomes alive, that it becomes relevant, that it becomes pertinent, that it impacts everybody, it gives life unto the image of the beast. And the, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Would this ever happen in the United States of America? The Bible saying it will happen. Even though the United States is a Protestant democratic nation, this Protestant democratic nation with a separation of church and state will so merge and so come together that they will speak 
and fulfill what the Bible says will happen. I know it sounds far-fetched and crazy, but it's absolutely true. Think about it. The United States gets obsessed with a particular country. Okay? Timbuktu. Okay? And then it says, we're going to have sanctions against this country. The United States just by themselves. Okay? And impose sanctions. And then they say, any country that it goes against our sanctions can, and trades with this other country, we will not allow you to trade in the United States. And they do it all the time. We, the, the United States does it all the time. I know I'm British, okay, and I may see things differently, but it's true. It's true. They enforce their will on other people. This is the United States. Okay, I don't quite see a rebellion as yet. So the United States has always had blue laws. The difference between the, the blue laws are laws which say, oh, you can't buy alcohol uh, before 11 a.m. or you can't go to the shops and buy a car or, or whatever. And, but the blue laws are different from the national Sunday law in this. The blue laws are, uh, are state laws. So you are different states having different blue laws, okay? But the national Sunday law is truly a national law. A national law. And this national law will be forced across the United States. And then what's established in the United States will go across the world. It starts here first. That means we have to live under it the longest. Okay? Just let you know. You're living here. That means you'll be under the Sunday law longer than other nations in this world. So if you want to move, <laughs> move now. <laughs> So the blue laws have always been in faith, in, in, on the statutes. Some, some states have the blue laws, but just do not enforce them. Other states have re, uh, um, rescinded these blue laws. Repealed. Is it repealed or rescinded? Dan? Repealed. Repealed these blue laws, okay? Other, uh, um, so they, as other states never had them, okay? But they're states with these blue laws. But these, these blue laws are different from the national Sunday law, which will be truly national and then international. Mrs. White says this in the book, Create Controversy. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns, and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as their special acknowledgement of her supremacy. And if you've been doing your reading, this is part of it. So what are the results of the Sunday law? When the Sunday law comes in, what are, the, what are going to be the results for us? First of all, it's going to help people, help the saints, help the redeemed receive the seal of God. Okay? This is a whole sermon which we will talk about later on in this, uh, in this series. Okay? The, the, there will be the saved receiving the seal of God. Now, if you do not receive the seal of God, what do you receive? Exactly. If you do not receive the seal of God, you're going to receive the mark of the beast. It's one or the other. In, in, in simple, it's either the character of God you have or the character of Satan. It's just one or the other. And, and the Sunday law is, is, is the last test to demonstrate who has what character. Then the, the Sunday law being enforced will be will mark the start of the time of trouble 
whole sermon on that as well. And then we've already talked about the shaking. When the Sunday law comes in, the shaking will intensify in the church. And many people will be saying, oh my goodness, I've got, I, I've, I've got to go to, I, I've got to obey the law. If I don't obey the law, I'm going to lose my job. If I don't obey the law, I'm going to lose my benefits. If I don't obey the law, they're going to close down my bank account. If I don't obey the law, I won't be able to see my grandkids. If I don't obey the law, I won't be able to travel. Kind of reminds you of something else. Anyway, and then also, it's the close of probation. Sunday law, uh, the Sunday law, when, the, when we uh, will mark the close of probation, first for the church, and then later on, for the world especially when the death penalty is issued then that's a close of probation for the world and finally it will it will demonstrate the coming together of church and state for for the Sunday law to happen you have to have the cooperation between the church and the state working in partnership to bring about their dastardly ends Number four, let's look at history because we've always said that history repeats itself and we can learn from history. So, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is all about the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and he dreamt about a statue and, and the head was made of the chest and arms were of thighs and, thigh, thighs and stomach were of and the legs were made of you guys know it. And then iron and clay and the stone came down and smashed it at the feet and it, it crumbled and the wind blew. Well, you guys know it. And you know that the gold represented? Uh, yeah, Babylon. Okay, and the silver represented? Media pressure. And the, and the Greeks were, were, the, were the bronze, weren't they? And the legs of iron were? Oh, you guys know it. You guys know it. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 2, in Daniel chapter 2, God is saying, God is saying, this is what's going to happen in the future. Isn't he? He saying, this is what's going to happen. You can, your empire, Nebuchadnezzar, will come to an end. Okay? And then there'll be another empire, and then another, and another, and another. Until I set up my empire, and my empire will not come to an end. And no human hand has anything to do with the setting up of my empire. This is what God told Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. Okay. So, what does Nebuchadnezzar do in chapter 3? He builds his own tower. He says, I want to create my future. I don't like the idea that my kingdom will come to an end. I'm going to have a kingdom that, is, that will last forever. In other words, he wants to be God. Because only God's kingdom lasts forever. Okay? And so he builds a statue of all gold. Now, what does he say should happen? He says that when you hear the music, that everybody should bow down and... <laughs> there we go. Bow down and worship this golden statue or this golden image. In other words... Listen carefully. Nebuchadnezzar is using religion and worship to create loyalty. He said, if you can worship my gods, worship like me, then you will be loyal to me and my kingdom. He says, I want people to be loyal, so I want them to worship Worship my image, my gods, my future, my dream. See, so has the band strike up? You know the story. Daniel chapter 1, let's read it. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then, and Herod cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, languages, that at what time he hear the sound of the cordet, flute, harp, sucksmith, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, he shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whosoever faileth not 
falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Nothing like a, an incentive to obey. If you don't, you're gonna die. So the, all this has a lot of correlations with the Sunday law. First of all, there's disobedience and rebellion against the plan of God. God set up his true day of worship. The papacy set up their false day of worship. Disobedience to the law and plan of God. Secondly, loyalty and ecumenicalism and fraternity. Please remember, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom involved lots of nations. And each of these nations had different gods and different ways of worship. But when they all came together, they were all worshipping one golden image. And that's what we see in the Sunday law. We will see different um, countries and nations and religions all coming together and worshipping and honouring one day of worship. Even now we see Muslims and the United Arab Emirates having Sunday as a day of rest in a Muslim country. Okay, and then worship and, and the threat of death. All these things, there's direct parallels between Daniel chapter 3 and the Sunday law. So, if, let's also look at what happened in history. So, we remember the Spanish Inquisition? During the Dark Ages, if you disagreed with the papacy, they had a way of persuading you. Called a rack or an other means of torture where they will stretch you and torture you, pull out fingers and nails until you uh, agreed with them. It was called the Inquisition. It was called the Inquisitions. They claim that up to 50 million people died at the hands of the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages. Nobody knows for certain, but that's what some historians guesstimate 50 million people because they believed differently because they wanted to live their lives differently because they didn't want to honor the pope and they were tortured or killed or murdered then um <laughs> there's the saint bartholomew's days massacre this was in france this is during the protestant reformation so at the time they had a, a Calvinist group of believers. Calvin is a type of Protestantism. And they had a, a Calvinist believers in France called the Huguenots. 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 Okay? And on St. Bartholomew's Day, a Catholic mob killed 30,000 Protestants on that day. It kind of reminds me of what happened in Rwanda between the Hutsis and the Tutsis. Uh, Hutus and Tuts Tutsis. Thank you. Okay? And how one mob killed thousands and thousands of the other because they had a secret code, a secret command. Now, this, this will do it. And this, the Catholic Church was behind this. Catholics killing Protestants. Okay, and let's not forget, remember, it's the United States that enforces it, not the papacy. It's not the papacy that enforces it. Okay, so many, of, so many people are watching, what is the Pope doing? What is the Pope doing? Don't worry about the Pope, what is the United States doing? That's what you need to be focusing. And what we see with the mandates are similarities between how it was enforced and how a Sunday law could possibly be enforced in the future. So, the other thing we see is this. God has given us free will to choose. To choose. Satan opposes free will. And whenever possible, he will want to force us to do what he wants us to do. But God always gives us a choice because true love involves a choice. And you can't be forced to love God. You must choose 
to love God. But Satan will willingly force you to worship him. So there's always a choice. And this choice will lead to the shaking in the Seventh-day Adventist church. This choice will lead us to make a decision. Are we in or out? Are we going to comply with the state? Or are we going to comply with God? Are we going to be loyal to our United States where we have our passport and, and our citizenship and our home? Or are we going to be loyal to the God who breathed life into us? And this will be an incredible shaking time, the final shaking time for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And lots of Seventh-day Adventists will be shaken out because they're not prepared for the Sunday law. And because they're not prepared the pressure on them to comply is ever so great. And they will capitulate and they'll do what the state says, do what the, the government says, do what the employer says in order to live, to do what they want to do. That's the final shaking. Because in the end, it's all about character. It's all about character. The Sunday law just reveals what's on the inside of us. It just brings to light what is in our heart. It just shows where our loyalties have lied and have always lied. Laid. Think about the three Hebrew boys. Going back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake unto... Uh, let, me, let, me, you should, let me just say this, okay? In, just in case you don't know the story. So Nebuchadnezzar sets up the statue. The music plays. And all his officials are bowing down. And worship it. Everybody's just bowing down. And then there's three Hebrews who are standing up like this. Everybody else is bowing down. And there are three Hebrews to say, you know what? We ain't bowing down. Even though we're in the minority, we're not bowing down. So they get called to the king, who's none too pleased at this disloyalty. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, let me just say this as well. They all work for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is their employer. Okay, who gives them the W-2? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Whoa. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Uh, usually they say, Oh, King, live forever. You know, and, and they say, You know, we, we, we ain't going to cut with that. Let's just, say, let's just put our cards on the table, okay? This is how it's going to be. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. <laughs> the crisis revealed what was inside of them. The crisis revealed their character. This, this didn't happen in an instant. This wasn't a committee meeting. This didn't go to vote. 
They said, this is where we stand. This is the hill I will die on. And this testing is going to come to all of us. It's going to come to all of us. This Sunday law. But the thing about this Sunday law, that's a major test. That's a huge life or death test. That, that, that's a colossal test. God doesn't just take you and drop you into this massive test. He grows you into that. He develops you so you grow to the point where you can stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He will grow you. As he did grow the three Hebrew boys. With Jeremiah, I like this text. If racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickets near the Jordan? In other words, God is saying to Jeremiah, listen, if you're finding it difficult with these small tests, how are you going to cope with the major ones? If you are crumbling now, in this little situation, how are you going to cope when it get really gets tough? And God prepared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for it. That was chapter 3. If you go back to chapter 1, we see one example of God preparing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see them coming to Babylon as slaves, being selected for special training. What a privilege. And then they're going to be fed from the king's table. My days, what an honor to be fed from the king's table. And it was a succulent and sumptuous spread of food. There was some shrimp and some lobster and a nice pig's head. <laughs> with an apple in its mouth. Roasted delicately with some herbs and spices. There was all these wonderful foods. I'm pretty sure there were some clean foods there as well. Some grapes, some, you know, some nuts and stuff like that. And you know what those Hebrews said? Those ungrateful young men? They said, we don't want your food. One, because it was unclean. Two, because it had been offered to idols. And they said, we don't want this food. You can change our name. You can get us to learn what you want us to learn. But you can't tell us what to eat. We don't want this food. Give us beans and water instead. <clears throat> that was their test. A health issue test. A worship test. And you know what? God blessed them abundantly because they stood up. And they were healthier and wiser than all of their compatriots. Please remember, they weren't the only three Hebrews. There were other Hebrews who just did what everybody else was doing. But they stood up under the test. So God is going to prepare us for the Sunday law. God is going to get us ready now in little areas of our life so that when the Sunday law comes, we can stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Perhaps he'll test us with our, with financially with our tithe or offering or with our taxes or with our generosity. Perhaps he'll test us that way. Perhaps he's going to test us in how we keep the Sabbath. The, the beginning and the ending of each Sabbath. Perhaps he's going to do what he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and test us through our health and what we should be eating and, and eventually becoming plant-based. Perhaps he's going to test us through relationships or any other way. God is going to bring these tests into our lives so that we can develop the character that will help us to stand in the final test. 
So for each of these tests, we should actually be saying, thank you, Lord, because you want me to grow. You don't want me to be weak. You want me to be able to stand. So we're grateful for the testing of God. As difficult as it may seem at the time, it is actually for our benefit and for our good. So, whew. that was a long one, because you ain't going to have me for three months. <laughs> so this is our recommended reading. And please note, there's not a lot of it this time. Okay? We're going to be reading um, The End of Time, How to Prepare, chapters 2 and 3. A Christian Service by Ellen G. White, chapter 14. The Great Controversy, chapter 35. And Last Day Events, chapter 9. I will read it, read it, read it. Because you need to know, in any sermon, the pastor can only tell you a small amount of the information that you need. But you can read and study for yourselves. See if I'm making it up. I could be here lying to you all. Prove it for yourselves. Prove it for yourselves. That's your recommending readings. Um, this is the book, End of Time. Uh, I was introduced to this book by Sister Marilyn. It's a great book, and it has lots of quotes from Mrs. Wright as, um, and put into sections which relate to each of the stages that we're going through in our sermon series. A great book. If you want one of these books, just go to my office and Phoebe will help you there. Okay? Our memory verse is this. And he said unto him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. What Satan said to Jesus, he is still saying today. He's still saying it today. I'll give you this if you compromise. I'll let you do this if you just give in a little. I'll do this for you. He's still saying the same lie, lie. Satan is a lie. He's a father of lies. He's been a murderer from the beginning. Do not believe his lies. It's decision time, church. Decision time. Sunday law, a test of your character. Will you stand or will you fail? If it's your desire to stand for Jesus, I invite you to stand right now. Let us pray. Father God, we want to thank you there, Lord, for your truth, for loving us so much that you're letting us know what is going to happen in the future and how we can prepare ourselves for it. We thank you there, Lord. And we're standing to our feet because we want to be able to stand for you then when it really counts. So we pray there, Lord, in every test that we face now, that we will develop the character of Jesus so that we can stand in the final great decision. Father God, grant us your Holy Spirit. Grant us more of your Holy Spirit. Drive out everything within us which is hindering your Holy Spirit from working in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.